All right, well, welcome everyone and uh, good, to, good to connect. Uh, obviously, this is our normal interview for what would be combine, uh, but per usual in the last 12 months, right, we're adapting and adjusting, so I appreciate everyone uh, accommodating. Um, as you would expect me to say, um, with the relative news that's been out in the headlines recently, you guys know the rules. I'm going to be uh, unable to make any serious comments on some of that stuff. And then, as always, in regard to free agency, again, just limited things that we can say at this time. Um, you, you just know that Chris and I and the staff are, you know, working diligently and very hard and excited, you know, about continuing to build a team and a roster that can win world championships with the kind of players that fit our culture and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. That's a, that's a never ending quest um, that gets talked about every day. It's very, very exciting. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing to make our team better. <clears throat> um, secondly, just wanna, uh, since this is the first time that we've talked uh, since the news of Nick Sirianni getting the, the head coaching job with the Philadelphia Eagles, I wanted to congratulate Nick. Um, you guys know Nick and I are super close um, there's very few people in this business who I think as highly of uh, as I do Nick. Uh, I just think he's one of the best offensive minds uh, in the NFL. I think he's got great coaching pedigree. I wish him uh, the best of luck. Um, I'm excited about the staff he's put together. Uh, I'm excited about his the opportunity he has in front of him with, with a very with a great organization there. So. Uh, wish them nothing, Nick and the Eagles, nothing but the best of success. Um, and then <clears throat> lastly, as far as opening, uh, obviously the news of because of that hiring, we had a unique scenario where uh, we had to hire six new coaches. Um, and I'm really excited about that opportunity to hire new coaches. I um, think we, we really got six quality men, six really good football coaches who fit who we are. Uh, have a vision for what we want to do, have a vision for how to get players better, have an expertise uh, and the experience to get done what we want to get done uh, as a coaching staff. So very excited about that. Um, and, and in particular, I would note, um, really excited for Marcus Brady, you know, to be our new offensive coordinator. Um, Marcus is more than ready for the job. I got the utmost confidence in him. I knew the day we got Marcus in the building, he was ready. Um, and, and I figured it would come to this. Um, I knew Nick would eventually get a head job pretty quickly because of the kind of coach he is. And uh, there was never a doubt in my mind that Marcus would be that next man up and that he'd be ready for the job. And so I'm excited for him and excited to work closely with him in that capacity as our coordinator. Uh, open it up for questions from there. All right, Joel Erickson. Frank, you, you started touching on this already, but just uh, a lot of turnover, especially on the offensive staff. How does, what drew you to some of the guys you hired and, and how do all their responsibilities break down? Very extensive interviews, you know, with each of the guys. Um, there's got to be a prove it mentality. Of course, we know their pedigree. Each one of them was kind of a different story behind the hiring. Um, I won't go into those one by one if you want to ask specifically about one guy, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but on several of them, there's a personal connection. On others, there's just their coaching pedigree. Their interview um, was outstanding. Uh, in all cases, uh, it was very clear, you know, who we had interviewed a lot of really good candidates, but each of these guys stood out amongst the other guys that we interviewed. Mike Chappell. Frank from the owner on down, Chris, yourself, and, and the expectations are is that, that this is a team ready to win now with, with holes to fill, obviously. How important is it to get, to get the quarterback situation correct, right? Yeah, it's very important. Um, <clears throat> very important, as, as we all know. I mean, it's a, it's a critical position. You always have that, that healthy tension of the quarterback position is really important, but the quarterback is just one man, you know, on the roster. So, uh, we do believe like we have we have the right roster, we have the right culture, um, and you know getting good quarterback play is, is something that is necessary to win a, a world championship. And obviously here in this organization, the standard has been set. Uh, 
and it's and I feel like we've gotten good quarterback play in recent years in our three years here as well. So uh, we need to continue to have that kind of play and even continue to improve upon that kind of play for us to to win a world championship. Thanks, Frank. Jake Arthur. Hey, Coach. Uh, with Marcus Brady and Scott Milanovic, they've got kind of interesting ties with the CFL. Uh, how do you think the your guys' offense could maybe adjust a little bit with, with some of those new ideas? Yeah, no, I, I think first and foremost, it's an excellent point, and there are similar ideas. And, you know, the CFL is everything spread out, and, of course, the NFL is going a little bit more to spread out stuff. Um, but both of these guys uh, – you know, Scott, I've known, you know, obviously Scott coached with Jacksonville for a few years. Um, Scott played at Maryland 10 years after I did. Um, so we, we kind of know each other for a while. Um, Scott is just an excellent football mind, excellent on quarterback play. Uh, I had a chance to go up to a camp where uh, Scott was working for Mark Trestman. He was the offensive coordinator with the Montreal Alouettes. And I went up there to work with their team for a few days. I sat in all the meetings that Scott was leading. I saw him working with the quarterbacks on the field. And I, I knew then, I said, if I ever had a chance to hire Scott, he, he was a guy who was on my list. He was, had complete command of, of the room, had com complete command of what it takes to play the quarterback position. And, um, and then, like I said, with Marcus, I didn't know as much about Marcus. Um, Scott was actually the one who recommended Marcus to me when I hired him uh, here as our assistant quarterback coach to start. And then Marcus won me over very quickly. So uh, they're, they're both really intelligent guys with a lot of good uh, innovative ideas and will keep us, uh, keep us moving in the right direction. Kevin Bowen. Hey, Frank, appreciate the time. Um, I know there's a lot of decisions still to be made at left tackle, but in your discussions with Chris, how much has Quentin expressed the desire to want to play left tackle if he has to you guys on a permanent basis? I think, uh, yeah, there's been lots of discussion between Chris and I. I think the, the discussion with Quentin is, you guys, and you guys would expect this, Quentin wants to do whatever is best for the team. He's willing to do whatever is best for the team. And what I appreciate about Quentin is that he trusts that Chris and I will, you know, w along with the staff, with the coaching staff, will make, will make what we believe is the best decision. And so uh, we want to get the best five guys on the field at the best positions for them. Um, it doesn't mean, uh, and they can grow into those positions. So uh, we're still keeping all options open at this point. Obviously, we've got the draft and free agency coming up. Um, we know we have multiple options, multiple good options, but each one of those ends up with a vision of us, of us having a top five offensive line. Um, and we're, we're going to find the best five players uh, to put out there, and we're confident. And we know those guys have already expressed to us, hey, just put us wherever you want us. We're, we're going to make it work. Jim Aiello. Hey, Frank, thanks for taking some time. Um, yep. I'm going to try to ask this question in a way I think you can answer it. Hopefully that's the way it goes. But with, conf with the quarterback position in terms of confidence, how important is a guy's confidence when they're, when they're playing the position game to game? And if a guy does lose confidence at any point, how can you as a coach or a coaching staff kind of try to build that up in practice or week to week or, you know, during a game? Yeah, no, it's a great question and very relevant question, right? Always uh, the confidence level of players at every position, uh, certainly not just the quarterback position. But I think one of the great misnomers um, is that sometimes that fans think like these the greatest players in the world. You know, I've seen I've seen some of the best players in the world. Everybody loses confidence for a moment. Uh, it may be brief, but um, it always goes back the same way, Jim. I mean, it's a one of the ways to build confidence back is you go back to the basics, you make it about, you, you, you go back to the fundamentals and technique, you go back to your basic schemes and you build it one play at a time. Um, that would, that's true for any of us. Um, and so that's, that's the way we'll handle every position. George Bremer. Coach, I got a couple of questions. Um, one, how important was it retaining Matt Eberflus on the defensive side of the ball just for continuity over there? And two, what are your thoughts on James Rowe? I, I know he's got a history with Kenny Moore. Yeah, yeah, George. Um, yeah, very important uh, to get Matt back. Um, you know, obviously he was a, a great candidate to be a head coach, but um, 
think the world of Matt as a coach, as a person, as a defensive coordinator, that we can just keep building, have the continuity, as you said, but keep building and growing and adapting the system to our players. Um, and I think Flus, uh, you know, I just seen Flus continue to grow and develop in, in that role as well, really connecting with players and making a conscious effort uh, to every week to put our players in the best position possible. I, I, I think he's extremely intelligent, uh, very focused in and on the vision for how he sees the defense executing and where we want to be as a defense. And I've enjoyed, I've learned a lot from Flus over these three years, you know, as I sit in there with him and we talk things through and I ask questions and I give two cents here and there, but uh, Flus, I'm really happy to have him back. Stephen Holder. Hey, Frank. Um, I, I know that we've kind of talked about this in the past. Uh, you, you've had three different quarterbacks. you passed three, three different starting quarterbacks your past three seasons, your first three seasons. Um, whether that changes, you know, we'll see. But, but just generally, how, how, what would it mean to have some continuity at that position if and when you can achieve that? What, what would that mean just from a, a continuity standpoint just, and also not having to be in this position, you know, every offseason as well? Yeah, no. I mean, obviously, continuity, right? We all understand at whatever our jobs is, it's just important. And, and I just think for our whole team, um, you know, for our whole team feeling like, hey, let's, in one respect, it's interesting. In one respect, you always feel like, okay, you know, we're going to play whatever cards we're dealt, whatever hand we're dealt, and we're going to play the cards well. So if we keep having to have a different starting quarterback every year, you do what you have to do. But obviously, the moves that we make, the moves that we make in free agency, um, are going to be designed to have a longer-term answer there. That's always been the goal to have a longer-term answer at that position that you can build around and grow. Because as you grow as an offense, because the quarterback is so central in in the offense going through him. Um, you know, being able to grow year by year is an important aspect of that. So that is certainly in our vision and plans um, for free agency at that position. Zach Kiefer. Hey, Frank, how's it going? Good. How you doing, Zach? Good. Um, I remember on day one, when you took over, you mentioned what your offense, what you wanted it to do. Run when you want to run, pass when you want to pass, keep the defense guessing. How much has your offense been tailored to specific quarterbacks each of the last three years? Because they all have a different skill set, right? Rivers, Kobe, Luck. And then how much do you also want to keep the principles that you believe in offensively and not specifically tailor them to the quarterback? How do you balance that? Yeah, yeah, we have had to adapt them um, year to year. Um, but that's been easy to do because we've had good quarterbacks and we've had good quarterback play. And um, so – you know, as as you go for as you go forward, like you said, Zach. I mean, this idea of the importance of running the football, um, the importance of running the football, and, and having a, a dynamic play action game that can get chunks down the field. There's different ways to do that. Um, you know, one conventional way is to say, hey, get a quarterback who's more mobile, and you get more nakeds and more bootlegs, and he's a threat to run, and so he can, he can make the play action game, you know, look a little different. Um, but I think this last year we proved it with having a quarterback like Phillip Rivers who just look at the yards per attempt, look at the chunk plays, look at how well we did as an offense. So there's more than one way to accomplish that vision that you're referring to, Zach, but you're exactly right. I mean, that is really what we want to do as an offense. We want to be able to dictate, right? We want to be able – it's like a boxer. You guys know I always like to use the boxing analogy. When you get in the ring, you want to set the tempo and the tone of the fight. And uh, having a quarterback that can do that is really important. Mike Wells. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Um, I'm going to go ahead and stick along with the quarterback theme as we're all trying to uh, go, go about asking this the right way. Um, as a head coach, how much do you enjoy, you know, coming up with a creative way? Because like Stephen alluded to, you're about to head into another year with a different quarterback. Do you embrace the challenge of having your system um, fit the quarterback you have? I mean, or is it a challenge? Yeah, it's both of those. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's a challenge, but, you know, we all like challenges, right? And um, But a lot of it, it's not about uh, – I, I hope that 
the guys that would be around us as an offensive staff and us as a staff, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, this is a player's game. So this is about putting the players on display. So as coaches, we have a job to, to, to figure out how to do that. And, um, but at the end of the day, we expect our players to outplay the coaching. And in fact, for us to win a world championship, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that the players do need to outplay their coaching. Now, I think they're going to get the best coaching they can get. Um, but I don't want it to be about us. You know, it's, it's about us each doing our job. Um, as coaches, we got a job to do, and we got to exhaust ourselves to do that. Um, and so is it a challenge? Yeah, it's a fun challenge. But really, the focus is on putting the player in the best position. And I, I want to follow up. The last time we talked to you was obviously after the uh, the Buffalo game, and you know the fourth down calls were a big topic. How much have you self evaluated your when you when you went back and looked at how how the season went from a coaching standpoint, a play calling standpoint for you? How much have you um, self evaluated yourself there? Yeah, a lot. I mean, go back and look at every game, look at uh, the calls, evaluate fourth down calls, evaluate critical situations, situational football. And, um, and, and look at it with a critical eye. What did I like about the decision? What didn't I like? I sit down and I talk with George Lee and John Parker and analytics guys. I sit down and talk with, you know, the offensive staff where it's relevant about certain situations. Um, hey, let's play this out again. Um, you know, always looking with a critical eye and how, how I can get better. Okay, Bob Kravitz. Yeah, kind of an odd question, Frank. Um, uh, you, you, the quarterback who shall not be named currently doesn't have a jersey number. Um, how did you decide on 14? Did it have any particular uh, relevance to you or significance? Um, yeah, I mean, four, actually four, my very first number in football was the number four. Four was a kind of family number um, without boring people with all the details about all the connections to the number four that myself and my family have. And then so 14 was a natural number for me. And, and that's the way it is with a lot of players. And um, any quarterback that would come in here, um, you know, would, you know, there's, there's only certain numbers that are available. You know, there's a couple of those quarterback numbers that are retired for good reason. And uh, they're going to stay retired, obviously. And so, um, you, you know, quarterbacks just come in and, and, and they, they, they look at the numbers available and, uh, and embrace the opportunity to, to make a new number uh, and to own it and to, and to bring a new dimension to that number for their game. So uh, that's usually the way it plays out. Real quick, were you surprised at all that Michael decided he didn't want to uh, give up the 11? No, I wasn't even surprised at all. I, okay. I, I would have been shocked. I would have been shocked if uh, I would have been shocked if, uh, you know, players don't like to give up numbers easy. And I thought I thought Michael looks good. I think Michael looks good in that number. And he played and he played good in that number. So I'm, I'm excited he's keeping that number. OK, thank you. Stacy Dales. Hey, Frank, thank you so much for the time. Um, you're such a great teacher with elite quarterbacks and obviously played the position um, at an elite level. What are the keys to teaching NFL quarterbacks? And all, we don't get to see those nuances when you break down, you know, the fundamentals, the individual performance, which translates to the scheme. What are the keys and why are you so good at it? Well, I appreciate that comment. You know, obviously, I think a big part of it is the players you're working with, but and some of it is having the sense to stay out of their way. And when you get a horse, pardon the analogy, when you get a horse that can go the distance and that is that can do something special, part of the key to coaching is don't, don't pull the reins back on them too much. And I think maybe my playing experience, um, not, just at, not just playing the position, but playing in the type of offense that I played in where Jim Kelly and I were calling our own plays and had a lot of input into the game plans. Um, I just think that's prepared me to work with quarterbacks at a high level and to have the kind of relationship with these guys where we're working together. That uh, Sure, they know that we're the coaching staff and we have the final say, but we see this as a, as a collaborative effort. And when you get special, when you get these special elite quarterbacks, um, you know, it's just, hey, let's let's find that healthy tension of it is my job as, as a coach and Marcus Brady and Scott Milanovic to, you know, have the hard coaching moments 
right? Have the hard coaching moments, but there's also a lot of moments where, hey, this is us together. I mean, 98% of it is positive, collaborative, let's do this. 2% of it is don't ever do that again. I mean, that's how kind of how it works out. Kevin Bowen. Greg, I know you had a couple guys opt out before last season. Um, Marvell Tell was one of them. Has he said anything to you guys about being back for this coming season? Yeah, those are all discussions on all the opt-out guys that, um, you know, Chris is kind of overseeing that whole that whole project. So we'll that'll all play itself out. Mike Chapel. Two things real quick, Frank, since we've talked to you. In, in, are there any major surgeries any players have had that might trickle into the offseason? And, and also, with no combine, maybe this is more of a question for Chris, but ha- how will this impact the evaluations going into the draft? So, you know, same as same as last year a little bit in that, you know, you just – you, you got – this is where – this is where I feel like – of course I feel this way. We got a competitive advantage because we had Chris Ballard and his staff. So um, we're going to they're going to exhaust every means possible to evaluate in every way possible. So, um, you know, it's the same for everybody. So it's harder. There's no doubt. But you got to be creative and you got to work hard at it. And I know we'll do that. Um, Chap, as far as injuries, I don't want to get into specifics, but the guys that we all know about are doing well. I just saw Marlon this morning in the back working hard and um, Paris, you know, doing well. Um, You know, I think. All those guys, everybody that had the little mi- the minor ones, everybody's everybody's doing well. Thanks. Okay, we'll go three more. Joel Erickson. Uh, Frank, uh, I, I know you said you weren't getting too much of free agency, but obviously a big decision looming with Ty Hilton. Um, what, what have you guys talked about with Ty and and where that might sit? Yeah, I mean Ty. I mean you're right. I mean we can't. It'll play itself out, but I'm not going to lie. I mean, the discussions we've had of, you know, I would just echo what Mr. Ursay said and what Chris said, I think, said in an interview or two. But I think we're all hoping that and optimistic and that there's a way that T.Y. can end his career as a Colt. Um, he's a special player. He means a lot to us as an organization. But we all understand there's a business side of it to it that has to be right. It has to be right for T.Y. It has to be right for the Colts. Um, you know, I'm just hopeful that that can play out. Um, T.Y.'s been a great player here. He's a, he's a leader on this team. And uh, ho- hope the business side of that can get worked out to where he can end his career as a Colt. Jim Aiello? Yeah, Frank, in terms of the quarterback position and evaluating it, um, how much do you rely on, obviously, your own, your own evaluation, your own eyes, and then – and then you do get these outside opinions maybe to, to confirm or, or go the other way. How, what is that process like in terms of evaluating quarterbacks? Yeah, Jim, that, that's a good way to ask it because, you know, I sometimes make reference to it's like a puzzle that you're, you know, you're getting a vision of who this player is. And so it's like a puzzle you put together and there's multiple pieces. And so when you're doing an evaluation, I obviously have a lot of confidence in my own evaluation and I'm going to work really hard at it. And so I'm going to, boom, I'm putting all those pieces together. But I, I also like talking to other people and from talking to other quarter, you know, you guys know, Jim, I think I talked to you about it. I talked to Peyton Manning. I talked to other ex quarterbacks. Um, Chris and I have a zillion conversations about it. Um, I'll talk to our offensive staff. And through all those other conversations, it's like you synthesize all that other information to maybe put in a, two or three last pieces to that puzzle. Um, I think it would be foolish as an evaluator to think you have all the answers and to not want to hear any other perspective. I think it takes confidence and maturity to want to listen to other people, to learn from other people, even in the evaluation process. Um, so I've enjoyed doing that over the years, talking, you know, talking to other people about um, every position, certainly the quarterback position as well. All right, last one, George Bremer. Coach, how, how important was your previous relationship with Philip Rivers last year and his knowledge of the offense in terms of getting things rolling more quickly in a new spot? And, and how much of a benefit is that to any quarterback coming into a new situation? Yeah, I think that's a good connection, George, because it, it really accelerated, especially in the unique circumstances that we're in with COVID. Um, and the limited off season that we had, um, it just helped accelerate the learning process. 
uh, of the offense of you know the the relationship that has to be built right because we we've said this a lot of times there, there's a personal aspect to the coaching a player it's not just you know this isn't just in a vacuum there's a personal element to it so anytime there's a personal connection with a player and there's a familiarity you know with the offense and the terminology and what you're trying to accomplish and the vision for what you're trying to do, it can help accelerate. And I think Philip showed that very clearly for him to be able to come in and play the way he did and to lead, you know, to lead the offense and the team the way he did. Uh, I think it helped a ton.